Well, it's great to see you, second service man. Welcome to Paul Land. I'm so glad you guys are here today. It's an exciting time at our church, where, as Phil mentioned earlier, uh, we're in the Believing for More initiative. And uh, two weeks ago, we had our commitment Sunday where people gave towards that what they might be willing to commit to over the next three years. And last week was our celebration Sunday. And uh, I said last week, man, I believe we could get over $5 million. Well, God has done it, man. We're at $5,336,000 to commit or given. We are kind of living Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can hope or imagine, according to his power that works within us. So it's an exciting time to be a part of. Man, I want to encourage you if, you, if you're not a part of it, you still have the opportunity. If you'd like to commit to something or give towards something, we've got, of that uh, 5.3 million, just to give you an idea, over 600,000 of it is in cash, man. So think about that. In one month, God has given all that through his people, man, 600,000. It's just incredible what he's doing. And so I'd just like to give God the glory for that and help us to remember, you know, maybe that how that strikes you. I don't know. But uh, to me, it's an unbelievable act of God that God's doing in our midst that we're being able to be a part of. And uh, I just want to encourage you with that a little bit today. I want to actually look at a patch of scripture to kind of put it in context about how I see what God's doing in our church and what I believe God wants to do in your life, how, how God wants to work. And so if you've got your Bible, open up to Joshua chapter 4. I want to look at a passage of scripture, and I want to help us just to see this from God's perspective, that God might get the glory for what he's doing in our church, and that we might remember this moment, you know, what God has done through us and is going to do in the future. So if you've got your Bible, Joshua chapter 4, the book of Joshua is a book of new beginnings. You know, Joshua's original name was Hosea. It's what he was born with. It means salvation. Uh, Moses changed it to Joshua. It's recorded for us in Numbers chapter 13, verse 16, where he changed his name to Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. It's the Hebrew form of the word Jesus, all right? So when you think about Joshua, same name as Jesus, you see this played out in the New Testament in Matthew 1, talking about Mary, she'll give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is a savior, right? Jehovah will save Jesus. So in a, in a sense, Old Testament Joshua is a type of Christ. He's the one that led the nation of Israel into the promised land. And the recording of that is found here early in the book of Joshua. I just want to take a look at this faith. The book of Joshua is about the victory that God wants to give his people as they live a life of faith. All right. And you see that demonstrated here in the life of Joshua. So this is Joshua chapter four. I'm going to begin in verse one. It says, when the whole nation, <clears throat> it's the nation of Israel had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you will stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men, and he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of Israel. To serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Or to serve as a reminder of what God did on this day. And so I want to kind of set this up because I think we need to remember what God is doing in our midst today, that it might be, in a sense, a memorial to us how God is at work in our midst. Now, the context of the book of Joshua, if you're not familiar with this, actually began 40 years earlier, almost to this very day, when the nation of Israel was in bondage in Egypt and God brought them out under the leadership of Moses. You know, they were in bondage. God sent the 10 plagues and they came out under the leadership of Moses, crossed through the Red Sea, and God brought them right to the brink of the promised land. And right over the Jordan River was the promised land. Moses sent out 12 spies to check it out. And these 12 spies spent 40 days in the promised land scouting it out. They came back and they gave their report. And the report's recorded for us in the book of Numbers, chapter 13. In this case, you know, this is 1327. They gave this account. We went into the land in which you sent us, and it does indeed flow with milk and honey. And here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. 
In fact, they're like giants. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. Man, there's no way, 10 of the 12 spies said, we can ever go into the promised land and take it. It's just too big of a deal for us. Joshua and Caleb, two of the spies, they said, no, man, we can do this. God is with us. God will give us the power to overcome. But the other 10 spies persuaded the people, and rather than going ahead in faith, they shrunk back in fear and were unwilling to go into the promised land. And because of that, God said, for every day that you spent scouting out the land, you're going to spend a year in the wilderness until this particular generation dies. Nobody gets to go in except the two people, Caleb and Joshua. And that's what happened. The whole nation of Israel spent the next 40 years in the wilderness wandering around while that entire generation died off. Everybody except Caleb and Joshua. And now here they are 40 years later back on the edge of the promised land. And God's going to lead them in. And the way he's going to lead them in is he says, hey, the promised land is right over there. Now, the promised land doesn't represent heaven, but it represents the life that God has for them on this earth, a better life than what they had. And it's all they had to do to get it was cross the Jordan River. Now, the two things about this particular story is this, is the key factor in both stories is faith. The faith of the people. When, if we're going to walk with God, it always requires faith, all right? And it does, it's not based on their ability. It's not based on their worthiness. It's, ba- it's not based on their accomplishments. It's not based on what they can do or not do. It's based on one thing, their faith in God's Word. The first generation was unwilling to, by faith, be obedient to God and go in. The second generation, by faith, okay, is going to cross the Jordan River and go into the promised land. God always has something better for us, but it always requires faith. It requires faith for our church to take this step of faith. It takes faith by you. It's not based on your ability or what you do. It's based upon faith. And, and if you just want to, you can take about any story in the Bible, and it almost seems like many times God stacks the deck against these particular people people to force them to either do it by faith or to shrink back in fear. So you can take Moses, for instance, when God spoke to Moses, the burning bush, I want you to go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Well, you know, there was probably 2 million slaves in Egypt at that time. This was the main economic driver of the entire nation. This is how the pyramids got built. And Moses says, you want me to go tell Pharaoh, just let them all go for free. That's impossible. He's never going to do that right? You know, it's just, you think about Gideon. Gideon is a guy that was a leader of Israel. He had, he had 32,000 troops, but the Midianites had 135,000. So there was 135,000 Midianites, and Gideon had 32,000 Israelites in his army, which I'm sure he was already scared. And God looks at Gideon, here's what he said, bro, you got too many people. You need to get rid of some of your troops. Literally, it's recorded for us. You know, in Judges chapter 7, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into your hands in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. You got to calm that down. Just tell anybody that's afraid they can go to the house. Now, if you've only got 32,000 troops to start with and you're going up to 135, I'm surprised he had anybody left. He said, hey, if you're afraid, just go to 22,000 guys left. Now he's got 10,000 men versus 135,000 men. God said, oh, you still got too many. Tell them to all go down there and get a drink of water, and whoever laps like a dog, keep thin. You know Gideon is like, please, Lord, let all 10,000 of those guys just drink like a dog. You know how many did? 300. 300. Now it's 300 versus 135,000. You going to do that battle? It's not based on whether you can or whether you have the, it's whether you're by faith or willing to do what God wants you to do. In the New Testament, same exact thing in the New Testament. You have 10 lepers in the book of Luke 17. They have leprosy. It's an incurable disease. It's contagious. If you get it, you have to live outside the camp. Nobody gets around you. There's nothing you can do about it. It kills the nerve endings and you're you get injuries and you, you just basically, it's like the living dead. And these 10 lepers see Jesus one day. They cry out to him, Jesus, master, Jesus, master, have mercy upon us. And all Jesus said, just Jesus looks at these guys and all he says to them, go show yourself to the priest. 
Now, the only reason to go show yourself to the priest was because in the Old Testament law, if you had leprosy and somehow miraculously got cured, you had to go to the priest so that he could look at you and determine that you didn't have leprosy. Then you would make the proper sacrifices. Then you could move back in to the village and see your family again. So that was kind of the first step. So this was like an encouraging thing on one hand, go show yourself to the priest. Problem was, there was absolutely no sign that anything had happened to him. They said, Jesus, have mercy on us. He says, go show yourself to the priest. Now, they all looked down. They still all had leprosy. They all felt the same way. There's no reason for them to go show yourself to the priest. So would you have gone? Go show yourself to the priest, it says in Luke chapter 17, verse 14. Uh, and, and as they went, they were cleansed. As they went... They were cleansed because it's a matter of faith, right? Jesus, you know, Jesus is out in the boat with Simon. Hey, Simon, let down your nets for a catch. Simon says, man, Jesus, we've been fishing all night long and haven't caught anything, right? Now, you think that story might have been different if, if Simon would have said, you know, we went fishing last night and we caught 100 fish. I can catch fish anywhere. You want me to fish right here in the middle of the day? I'll do it. Ain't no problem. I think what happened was it? We fished all night long and didn't catch one thing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. See, it's all about faith in spite of the circumstances that you find yourself in. So here's the plan. God gives them this plan. It's recorded for us in Joshua chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said to Joshua. So this is God speaking. The Lord said to Joshua, uh, today I'll begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant when they reached the, ed of the, uh, the edge of the Jordan's water to go and stand in the river. Here's the plan. So tell the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and go stand in the middle of the river. Verse 13, and as soon as the priest who carried the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of, it, of, of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Just go tell them to walk out there, and when it happens, the water is going to stop flowing. Now, the problem about this particular day, as we're going to see, it was, it was at flood stage. So, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. So the people crossed over on, on dry land. This is the, the plan, you know, we want you to just pick up the ark of the covenant, walk down to the Jordan River and, and go out there. And when you do, the water's going to stop flowing. Now the problem if you know the story, as I just read, it was at flood stage. So this story actually took place almost the exact same time of year in which we're living. It was 10 days before Passover, which is right around Easter. So it would have just happened. And uh, they estimate that the Jordan River during flood stage could get up to a mile wide. Now, I've seen some big rivers in my days. Uh, for those of you who have gone to Mozambique, that lip of Popo you got to cross. to go into Mozambique, you got to drive across it. It's a good mile wide. But if you can imagine it a mile wide in flood stage... I've seen the headwaters of the Amazon. If it's a mile wide, that means not only are you not going to walk across it, you're not going to swim across it either, right? And the plan is that the priests are going to take the Ark of the Covenant, and they're going to walk down there, and they're going to walk into it, and the water's going to stop up, and they're going to walk up on dry ground. Now, if you can just imagine being one of those, one of those priests and you pick up the Ark of the Covenant and you're walking down there. You see this huge river in front of you. It's at flood stage. And you've got the most important thing that you possess, which is the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God. And you're carrying this thing. And uh, what do you think is going to happen to you? You know there's some people thinking, as soon as you step in that river, you're going to be swept away. The Ark of the Covenant is going to be lost. And this is going to be the worst day that ever happened in the nation of Israel. You see... Not only does it require faith to follow God, but faith always requires action. Those priests had to walk up to that water, and the water didn't stop until their foot touched the water. And that's when it stopped. It said it stopped at a town called Adam, 19 miles upstream. So perhaps there was some kind of earthquake, and, and the water got, you know, dammed up, and it was flowing. And as soon as the priest walked up there, at the very moment his feet touched the water, it was just like the water just quit. And it just kept going, and all at once it was on dry ground. Can you imagine that moment for that priest? 
I mean, all the courage it would have taken for you to pick up that ark, and here you are walking to that river, and the moment your foot hits the water, the water just stops flowing. That'd be something you'd tell your grandkids about. The moment my foot hit it, the water stopped flowing. Because, see, this is the way faith is. Following God requires faith. Faith always requires action. Like there are people in this room, we could go around and discuss it. We could all say we have faith. How do you prove your faith? Are you doing anything with your faith that requires any action? Because acts of faith always require action. It's like we've got $5.336 million committed. That doesn't mean it's been paid. But if you've committed to it, see, now we trust God to fulfill what he's called us to do. We take the next step and actually give the money. And through that, we come to know God. When those priests stepped up and their foot hit the water and their water stopped going all at once, man, think about what that did to their faith. Man, they saw the reality of God. We're not just talking about theory now. It's the reality of God. When you take your faith and add action to it and God does what he's going to do, it gives you a reality of God in your life. I'm not just talking about it. When I was a young man, I got called a seminary. I was living in Enid, Oklahoma at the time, minding my own business. I was a banker, you know, had two kids, owned my own house, making a living. I was pretty happy about life. And God spoke to my wife and I, called us into the ministry uh, one Sunday evening at church, and uh, you know, I, I wasn't—I was raised going to church, but I really didn't have any good theology. I really didn't know, so I knew I needed to go to seminary, work on my master's degree. So my wife and I talked about it, and we said, "Hey, it was about this time of year, actually, when God called me in the ministry." So we need to go to seminary. Maybe we could go next semester. All these people said, you need to take a year to, you know, get your ducks in a row. I was like, a year? Who's got time for a year, man? I'm going this fall. So. Uh, you know, I, I applied for seminary, sent in my application off, and we were out in our, our yard one day, one evening, talking about my wife and I, and we said, man, if we're going to go to seminary, we're going to have to sell our house, right? And I said, man, the only way you can sell a house is you put a for sale sign up in the front yard, and then, of course, you got a risk of your boss seeing that, and you're losing your job, and all sorts of people asking why you're selling your house. And I said, but this is what God's called us to do. We're going to have to put this for sale sign up in our front yard right? We had it in our garage right there. And I can remember for us, this was like a major step of faith, man, just to go out in our front yard and nail that up and say, hey, we're going to sell our house. This is what God's going to do. And of course, you know, my boss saw it that night, some weird coincidence, you know? And so now here's my career shot. And the and, uh, problem was I still hadn't been accepted to seminary and I didn't have my house sold. There were about five other houses on my block that was for sale. And that went all during the summer. It got down to the month of August and it was kind of like, man, if my house doesn't sell or I don't get accepted to seminary, I can't go this fall and it's going to start right here, you know, the end of August. And, and uh, so one day I just went up to the church. I decided to skip lunch and go up to the church and and pray just to fast, you know, do away with something physical and just put my focus upon God. So I just skipped lunch that day at noon, went up to the church, had a little prayer room. I just went in there because if you choose to follow God by faith, there's going to come a moment where you're going to wonder, is this going to work? And why aren't things turning out like I thought they were going to turn out? And I thought God was going to do this and why isn't God doing that? And here I am in this difficult situation, my boss has already found out. This is not even, I'm like having to make more straw with, you know, more bricks with less straw, right? So I just go up there and pray and say, God, I, I don't know what to do, man. I've applied. I haven't heard from seminary. I've got my house for sale. I haven't had anybody call on it. And, and man, I was trying to follow you. And now, right, I just went up and prayed about it. So I get done praying about noon. You know, I head back up to the office, and this is back before cell phones. And so my wife, as I'm going to the office, my wife's walking out to the post you know, out to the end of our street to our mailbox. And at one o'clock that exact same day, she opens our mailbox and there's my acceptance letter to seminary on the very day. Like, what's the odds of that? I get back to my office. My wife's calling me. Hey, you won't believe what we got in the mail today. I didn't even tell her I was going down there to pray. What do you think that does to your faith? See, all at once, this thing just becomes real for you. You just saw God do something right there. We just all experienced God provide $5.33 through our church. This is real. The power of God. That afternoon, we had four calls on our house. We had somebody come over and look at it that night and put a contract on it that week. Now, I needed that because you know what? Going to seminary is one of the hardest things I ever did. 
But you have something like that happens to you. You're like, man, if God can do that, God can do anything. See, God calls us to live by faith, but faith always takes action. But when we act upon our faith, God does something in us. Because look, man, they're going to cross this Jordan River. There's other stuff on the other side. They still got Jericho to defeat. They still got the Canaanite nation to defeat. They got lots of enemies they got to overcome, just like us as a church, man. But when God does something, you can look back at that and say, look what God did. Here's the thing about the nation of Israel. When they acted in faith, for them to cross over, they had to leave some things behind. I mean, you have the nation of Israel. For 40 years, they've been wandering in the wilderness, right? And, and they're eating manna every day, pitching their tents. When the ark, the, when the kind of glory moved, they moved. If not, they stayed there. It wasn't much of a life, but it was their life. Everything about that was normal. And for them to go into the promised land meant all that was going to have to change. They were going to go over there and they were going to get some land. They were going to settle down. They were going to get their own house. It was going to be a better life, but it was going to be a different life. And the only way they could live the better life was to leave the old way of life behind. Right? It's kind of like for us as a church. You know, I, 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 we've been talking about a new building for years. I got a letter one time from a, a, a lady and, and I had to agree with the la- everything she says. She says, man, I kind of hate, hate to move out of the sprung. I love the sprung. Every time I work spin the sprung, it reminds me of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And it reminds me that we're all just temporarily passing through this earth because God's got something better for us. And I'm like, I'm the same way, man. I love the sprung and what God does in this sprung. But the reality is it's not the sprung. It's the God that we serve in the sprung. All right? And God's doing a work. And I kind of hate to see the sprung go. But you can't go on with God and stay where you're at. And that goes for everybody in this room. God's got a better life for you. No matter how long you've been walking with Jesus, he's got something better for you. But the only way you're going to get there is if you move with him. And that means there's some things in your life you're going to have to leave behind. And there are some people in this room right now, you've got some things in your life. If you'd be honest, you say, I've got these things in my life. And for me to go on with God, I need to leave them on the other side of the river. I need to bury them in the bottom when I pass by. This needs to be something I need to stop doing because whenever I do this, it disrupts my walk with Jesus, and I need to stop this. I've got some sin, some habit, something in my life, right? You need to crucify that, bury it, leave it behind, and go on to what God has for you. You know, some of you, this shame and guilt that you've been hanging on to, it's keeping you back from what God really has for you. Oh, because God can never use me because of what happened to me or what I did. And you confess it. You ask for God's forgiveness. You repent of it, and you go on to what God has for you next. He's got something better for you to keep living that way. See, the problem is in some people's life, I heard a guy say one time, we have a tendency to to pray these bluebell prayers. And he said what he meant by that, he said, I had a friend one time that every night before he went to bed, he'd eat a bowl of bluebells. He said, the more he ate, the bigger his bowl got and the bigger he got, right? And finally, after a while, his wife looked at him one day and says, man, you're putting on a lot of weight over there. And he goes, I know, man, it's this bluebell. <laughs> he said, Lord, help me quit eating the bluebell. And he got up right then and he put his bowl in the sink and he took the container of bluebell and put it back in the freezer. Because that's the way we are sometimes. We pray that God will help us quit something and then we put it back in the freezer. It's like, maybe in case I need it in the future... Like, I'm not going to eat another bowl tonight, but, you know, tomorrow night's coming. <laughs> I might not eat another bowl tomorrow night, but next week might be here before you know it. And what if I can't take it without my bluebell? I don't want to get rid of it completely. I want to just keep it around. We play these, pray these bluebell prayers with our sin, man. Guess what? It's always going to keep coming up until you crucify it, until you bury it. Man, throw it in the trash. Flush it down the toilet, pour it down the sink, unplug the cable, get rid of your subscription, get rid of whatever it is in your life that's causing you to stumble so you can walk in the way that Jesus Christ wants you to walk. You say, Kurt, I've tried that before and I just can't. Well, that's, no, that's not surprising. Ain't nobody can overcome sin under their own power. It puts you in bondage. It keeps you in slavery. You cannot overcome sin. The only way you can overcome sin is to come to Jesus and ask Jesus to do what you can never do on your own. How do you come to Jesus? Strictly by faith. By faith, you come to Jesus. Say, Jesus, could you take care of my sin? Right? Because you want me to cross over. Cross over by faith into a better life that God 
has for you. These, the Israelites cross over, and God says, one last thing I want you to do. I want you to pick up 12 stones from the middle of the river. I want you right where the priest stood. I want you to go pick up 12 stones and take them to where you're going to camp tonight. I want you to put them up as a memorial so you can remember what God is doing and has done in your midst. So they go out and pick up these 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel, take them to camp, which is Gilgal, eight miles away, by the way, and they make them a memorial. God said, I want you to do this to serve, verse 6, as a, as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask, hey, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? You can tell them, here's what God did in our midst one day because we're always only one generation away right, from the next people not knowing about Jesus and the, way of, the ways of God. Then he goes on to say in verse 21, he said to the Israelites, in the future when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Who did it? For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. And the Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he did to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we all crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. You think about the nation of Israel under Yahweh when they enter into the promised land, which is full of Canaanites. The question was, which God is more powerful, right? So you have the Canaanites in the, in the promised land. They worship a God named Baal. You read about him if you read your Bible. You see that later on. Uh, Jezebel was a Baal worshiper. In their mythology, Baal was the most high God in their minds because he had defeated the God of the sea, and he, uh, he, he was the God of water, rain, and uh, the seas and the lakes. And it was like Yahweh showed up and said, Brother, let's have a little showdown about which God's really the all, tr one true God. And it was God himself, you see, in the Ark of the Covenant that actually walked into the Jordan River and caused it to dry up. The nation of Israel, just by faith, got to walk across it's a reality for us as a church, this, this, this believing for more what God's doing in our midst right now. The reality is it's God who's doing the work. It's God who's moving on people's hearts. There's people who have sacrificially given not because they're great people. It's because they know Jesus and God's working in their heart. And so God's the one that's making the way. We just get to cross over and be a part of that. So it was God who went into the Jordan, and when he did, he parted the water, and when they walked across, God says, make a memorial so that all the peoples might know. In fact, you can read the very next verse, chapter 5, verse 1, and when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan, their hearts melted. Why? Because they knew they were toast. So we serve a God that is powerful. He has the ability to save you if you're willing to put your faith in him. He has the ability to forgive you, to empower you, to go before you, to lead you into a better life if you're willing to buy faith to get a hold of him. Because God is the one that has the ability to do it. When we put our faith in him, he goes before us that we might cross over. It's a picture of what Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus Christ himself came down onto this planet, took on the devil on his own turf, and he went to the cross and he defeated him on the cross and defeated all the weapons that he had, which were sin, death, and hell. He was then buried for three days, came back to life to prove it, and then crossed back over into the Father, providing a way for us to cross over. Amen. And how do you get a hold of the cross over when you go to Jesus, man? You get a hold of it by faith, right? By faith, you attach yourself to Jesus, and just like they walked over on dry ground, one day you'll walk over on dry ground. And Jesus has a better life for every person in this room, even on this earth, until the day you die. So how do I get a hold of that, Kurt? You do it by faith. You act upon your faith. Some people in this room, you've been thinking about Jesus for a long time, but you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. It's time to get your feet wet. Some people in here that have been giving your life to Christ, you've never been baptized, right? It's like we saw today. What a great picture, man. Public testimony of our faith in Jesus, man, going out and doing it. You know, God's always got something more force or some of you got some things in your life you need to leave behind so you can go on to what God has had for you it's not enough just to know it it's when you act upon it that the power of God comes in your life and he begins to accomplish what you could never do on your own and when you accomplish that you see the reality of God working in your life and you're never the same after that amen amen let's pray father we thank you for your word Jesus we pray that we could get a hold 
of the truth of Scripture, that by faith today we could press in on you and take the steps you want us to take, God. It might seem impossible. Just like this whole building project seemed impossible to me. And yet, yeah, God, you're the God of faith. When we do what you want us to do, you do what we could never imagine possible. Do you? you can set us free. You forgive us. Grant us salvation. Give us eternal life. All through the name of Jesus, Father. I pray that you might work even as we close out our service. Do this last song. In Jesus' name, amen.